Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, unfortunately, I'm presenting remotely. Hopefully, everyone can hear me well. Uh, I will be talking today about S bad revocation mechanism and how I think it should be managed in Linux distributions. This is mostly targeted not at the end users, but more at people building the distribution, maintaining the life cycle of the distribution, how, from my perspective, you should approach that. And I'm talking as the person who deals with the boot stack in Oracle Linux, and basically all the problems I will be highlighting are valid for us as well, and I believe they, they can be extended uh, to others as well. So, uh, ironically, this presentation was prepared back in July, and uh, it became even more important right now. So I'm not sure if people know about that, but there was a recent uh, security update issued by Microsoft in August, which caused uh, uh, quite a large event of dual boot systems being unable to boot into Linux. Uh, that pretty much enforces my point of view. People need to be more aware about but They need to understand how to manage that on a distribution level. And I will be talking about that a little bit uh, right now. So um, I'm not going to be diving deep into secure boot because I hope people have a certain understanding of that. I will be talking about them at quite high level. So uh, UFI as BAT is a UFI secure boot advanced targeting mechanism. It was developed and introduced by a team Shim development group. Uh, pretty much engineers from all major distributions, a lot of open source developers were involved into that, and Microsoft were a part of that development process as well. It is implemented by both Microsoft uh, Windows and by major Linux vendors. Pretty much everyone can use it for their purposes. It doesn't replace uh, UFI Secure Boot uh, traditional verification using signatures and certificates. It, it supplements it. In the first place, uh, initially it was introduced because we have faced quite a large, or I would say growing number of uh, CVs in boot components. And each such event requires the revocation of the affected binaries by hash certificates that were used to sign those binaries. And unfortunately, uh, the event of hitting the upper limit of UEFI and the RAM variable size was quite possible. Uh, so there was a huge event of brainstorm, brainstorming between major developers to introduce a new supplemental mechanism uh, to have an alternative way of revocating binaries. Ironically, that happened four years ago, so this feature is not quite new. There was a huge uh, boot hole event, quite a lot of CVs were discovered in Grub, and SBAT was implemented specifically to ensure that we have a new way of revoking binaries. Essentially, each binary which is being verified by Shim uh, now contains a specific .sbat section in the binary itself, which is basically a set of UTF-8 encoded strings, which lists the component name, its generation, and Shim performs the verification of those names and generation against expected values. And if generation is lower than the one uh, which is allowed uh, to be booted, uh, that verification doesn't pass and you can boot the binary. Uh, once again, it doesn't replace certificate verification, it supplements it. So you need to match both. Uh, binary is signed by the, by the certificate expected by uh, UEFI firmware or SHIM, and SBAT generation matches the expected value. Uh, that actually provides a lot of benefits for the distributions because the revocation event becomes uh, much easier, not so much space is consumed in, in the NVRAM, and also it's quite easy to verify if your binary will pass through secure boot verification or not, even on the user level. Uh, the event I'm talking that happened in August uh, 2024 uh, is that Microsoft issued their security update, which enforced the latest SBAT revocation. Once again, ironically, that's not even a new revocation. That event happened in spring. And that caused dual boot failures um, in case some Linux distribution was booted through USB drive on the system. A lot of end users were actually blaming Microsoft that it was their fault. Um, it's kind of like yes and no. Microsoft is in the picture because they pushed that revocation event. Theoretically, by their design, it should not have affected Linux distributions which are booted from the USB drives because that update was supposed to detect that. But still, that happened. At the same time, I can't blame them because uh, 
as a maintainer of the distribution, you're expected to push latest security fixes, and as the end user, you're supposed to consume those security fixes. So in that exact case, affected distributions didn't have the latest updated uh, boot components, and essentially, latest applied update uh, ended up in those Linux systems being unbootable. Uh, could it have been done differently? Well, yes, obviously. So first of all, Microsoft could have prevented that. And second, uh, end users should have updated their system. I can't even say that I blame maintainers of the, of the distributions who were affected. I'm talking about Linux distributions because as far as I know, all major distributions that were affected, they in fact already had the updates. It's the end user who didn't install the updated binary. Uh, that caused uh, to the problem that, but as any new feature, though once again I'm saying a new feature, while ironically it's four years old. And when that uh, when a new feature causes any issues, it is uh, demonizing. So people start talking why it was introduced in the first place. We don't need it. It should have been done differently. So I believe on top of the responsibility of distribution maintainers to introduce a new feature and maintain it, there is also a um, responsibility to educate uh, end users that there is a new feature and it should be dealt with. So that could be a, a wiki page, uh, they could be um, email sent to the mail list that people uh, should be aware of the new feature. Anyway, you should give some breadcrumbs to the people so they can find the information and educate them about a uh, new feature. Uh, once again, coming back to why it was introduced, it was introduced for an easier event of revocation. Strictly speaking, the same exact thing could have happened with a traditional revocation event using certificates because if you were running a shim or grab binary that was signed with a certificate of, uh, that was revoked, or that um, uh, binary was revoked by hash, you would have faced exactly the same situation. The DBX uh, update would have blocked your, uh, your dual booted distribution as well. Also, it's important to keep in mind that that revocation is done for updating NVRAM variable, which is obviously the same uh, for all distributions running on the system. So strictly speaking, you, you could have ended up in the same exact place even if you were running two Linux systems on the same machine and one machine was updated to the latest binaries with new revocations, you have booted into it, you rebooted into all the system, it would be locked down. What vendors need to take care of? I would say, first of all, this is a call to participate in open source development. Uh, if you ship uh, shim, uh, which is signed with Microsoft certificate, if you participate in any development, please be involved in shim development. Uh, please submit code. Please check what new code is being submitted. Uh, please get educated with how revocations are being taken care of. Uh, in enterprise distributions, and I believe to a certain extent that applies even to running Linux at home, people often want to roll back to the older bootloader. They want to run all the versions of bootloaders for whatever version. And in many cases, they may end up locked down. And if you roll back to the uh, bootloader that is no longer allowed to be booted, it is revoked either by traditional DBX revocation or by SBAT revocation, you will no longer be able to uh, boot into that bootloader. Oh, I would say on the distribution level, it's important to ensure the integrity of boot stack. Uh, generally, we talk about like three components. It's shim, grab, and kernel. So uh, you need to ensure you're always running on kind of like the same up update level of the kernel, grab, and shim. Because if you update the shim, you, you didn't update the grub and you didn't update the kernel, you may end up with mismatched boot components. So shim will no longer be trusting your grub or uh, it will not be trusting your kernel and you once again may end up locked down. In Oracle Linux, we are uh, ensuring integrity of bootstack using uh, RPM dependency mechanism. So pretty much we also ensure that if you update to latest grub, uh, the expected version of shim and expected version of kernel is being installed. We don't talk down to exact version. We introduce an artificial dependency of the, I would say, update level. So we 
what we check is that update level of grab kernel and shim match each other. And if you need to move to the older version, you b basically roll back the whole boot stack, not just a single component to prevent a locking down. Once again, it's important to educate your users that uh, a rollback is possible only up to a certain level. If you roll back too much, uh, you can no longer boot that older versions. And as I have uh, told already, it's important to monitor upstream development, it's important to track CVs, and it's important to understand how secure boot works. Unfortunately, right now we are facing the situation of quite a lot of CVs emerging in the wild, so I expect such events of revocation will be happening more and more often. Uh, that's kind of like the life of dealing uh, with <laughs> security issues. Uh, once again, it's important to say when we talk about secure boot, uh, we often consider Microsoft powered secure boot when Microsoft certificates are enrolled in the UEFI firmware as just secure boot. That's not actually so. Uh, you can introduce your own secure boot infrastructure so you can enroll your certificates into UEFI, UEFI firmware. You will be the only owner of any event happening in the system. However, still, if you boot any binary you have picked up uh, from other distribution, you need to be aware that that binary can do whatever it can. So if you pick up Shim, for example, from Fedora, you sign it with certificate which is enrolled into your firmware, that Shim from Fedora will enroll latest but revocation that was added to that Shim. So once again, it's important to understand what new features do. Uh, one of the benefits of ZBAT is that it's quite easy to work with that on the user space level. So pretty much um, first tool that will be very handy for you is Objdump. Uh, so first of all, it can be used uh, to verify the .sbat section of the binary that you want to check. Uh, so for example, if you install the update of the grab boot loader, you can easily check um, what is in its sbat section. I can show that right now. Yeah, we see it's represented in a human readable format. So pretty much even before rebooting the machine, after installing the update, we can see what SBAT data is being supplied by that EFI file, so we can know in advance if it's bootable or not. Uh, you can also uh, check the current state of um, SBAT level, either by using MockUtil or by parsing the NVRAM variable directly. So once again, you can know in advance uh, what is your current SBAT policy which is being applied. However, keep in mind if you install a new shim which will enforce a new SBAT uh, level, that level will be applied only after your system is obviously rebooted. And if you have a multi-boot system with multiple distributions enrolled, be it uh, Windows plus Linux or dual boot Linux system, you need to monitor update flow for both systems. Because if one system gets a shim update that uh, enrolls a new SBAT revocation level, that revocation level will be applied for the second distribution as well. And the only thing I can say, you need to embrace the future. Yes, uh, revocation and secure boot becomes a little bit more complex from one point of view. At the same time, it gives you a quite easy way of managing revocation events and uh, treating security issues. It also makes life easier for people because revoking binaries by generation level is much easier compared to revocation using hash or certificate because you don't need to get Microsoft involved. You can do that just on the shim level. Uh, one of the future events that shim community is working on is first of all enforcing as bad revocation for kernel, which is not currently on place right now as bad revocation is applied only to shim itself by self verification and to grub, which is verified by shim. Uh, we plan to do same for kernel and work is uh, happening right now for that. And I believe as uh, the end of my talk, I would say, please get used to Shim GitHub repository, Shim as bad documentation. You also want to enroll into Shim review, a GitHub repository, because you will see if people start submitting new Shims for review, and that might force you to figure out that something is happening, and you need to update Shim in your distribution as well. And get used to MockUtil, because MockUtil will be the main tool for you to work with SBAT.
Uh, and last piece of advice, check if you can disable secure boot on firmware level, because in case of any fail of BAT or secure boot verification, you have an easy way out just by disabling secure boot. If secure boot is disabled, uh, but revocation is not being applied. Um, any questions or comments? So I've got one based on your sort of statement at the beginning. I think what this demonstrates, this whole SBAT problem, is the revocation is too hard a policy for users. So we get this wrong in the fact that we shouldn't have chosen revocation as the way of trying to enforce a security policy. Because what it meant, as you say there, is loads of people's systems just didn't work and they turned off secure boot. Most of them haven't turned secure boot back on. And I think we can fix this partially by giving the users better control of SBAT and MockUtil. For instance, MockUtil has no way of rolling back to a previous version of SBAT if the user instructs it. Again, it's the hardness of the policy. It's only under the control of the people who issue the policy. It's not under the control of the user of the system. And all security policy should really be under the control of the system. So I think we need to do a better job of getting SBAT policy control back in the hands of users for the odd time that they actually need to do something like this. So I, is there a I plan can't, for that? I, yeah, uh, I can't fully agree with you. You're saying we are not giving uh, end user control of the policies. We in fact give. Uh, first of all, it's up to the distribution maintainer what policy enforcement they will set in SHIM. Uh, by default, SHIM will be applying like the latest policy, which is revoke latest revocation. However, you can build your distribution SHIM, which will be falling back either to the previous uh, revocation or to like the initial one. So if SHIM is built with no enforcement of latest revocation, the decision to enforce latest revocation will be exclusively on the user. So it's a shared responsibility. First of all, distribution maintainers should decide how they want to enforce revocation. Will it be a hard event or user will be driving and rolling the revocation? But we already have that feature. It's already working right now. In Oracle Linux, we built latest shim exactly like that. And it was driven exactly by the internal desire for some teams to enroll revocation when they want, not when we want. <laughs> So um, I, I've implemented the um, secure boot infrastructure for Amazon Linux, and I don't have a shim. I don't want a shim. Uh, the user controls which keys are enrolled in the uh, virtual machines in, uh, in our instances. We put our keys. We don't put Microsoft keys in there. Uh, the shim is just overhead. The problem is because we don't have a shim, we don't have SBAT. And I would love to have SBAT to be able to do that version-based uh, or generation-based uh, revocation and not blow up my, uh, my NVRAM. So are you aware of any ongoing effort to implement some form of SBAT support directly in EDK2 so that mm -hmm. We can have some, thought, some form of you know, generation-based uh, revocation without the shim. Uh, first of all, my comment, I very much like that you use your own custom security boot deployment. I really like that because that, that's how it should be done. We shouldn't be locked down to vendor-based solution. I'm not mentioning what vendor is enforcing that. Second command, unfortunately, I'm not aware of UFI development implementing something like that. Sorry. Uh, maybe I will reply your question. As far as I can tell, there was some discussion about in implementing SBAT in the, the EDK2, but just rough discussions. But I think in the yes. future it will be implemented. I mean, we could do it ourselves. Yeah, I, <laughs> uh, because uh, just uh, the prob problem, <laughs> a problem is the same for everyone. As soon as the amount of data you need to store in NVRAM variables grows, you will be hitting the NVRAM variable limit. So, yeah, problem is the same with SHIM or without SHIM. Time's up. Sorry, time is out. Thank you for presentation, Alex. Uh, and thank you. Thanks, everyone.